Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all our participants around the world. Welcome to the University of Essex Human Rights Center's special event to commemorate the International Tolerance Day. Um, we've been marking this day for the past six years as a commitment to promote respect for diversity and human rights. This day has been declared as the International Day of Tolerance by the UN General Assembly, UN General Assembly um, to commemorate the fact that the previous year on this day, UNESCO erupted the principles of, of toler toleration, which recognized that tolerance is not an indulgence or a concession, but an active, active recognition, act, active acceptance of, of the other um, in, in all our, diver, in all our diver, diversity. And recognizing that in a pluralistic world, uh, an ever-growing diverse, diverse world, a recognition of, of difference, harmony and difference was fundamental for peace and for such resilience. A key aspect of this is to respect human rights, especially freedom of thought, conscience, and religion or belief, as well as the various ways of human beings express themselves. Uh, today we have a fantastic lineup of speakers, uh, of, of global experts, uh, practitioners working in a variety of fields uh, covering uh, issues like respect for religious diversity, uh, respect for uh, soji rights, as well as the uh, UN's global global program to combat hate, and also uh, our expert on how technology is impacting on the way we live and work and what that means for tolerant societies. With those words, I want to thank our distinguished participants, and I want to hand over to moderate session to the chair of the Human Rights Center and then director, Dr. Andrew Fagan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Armin, and thank you for promoting me to the chair of the Human Rights Center as well. It's, a, <laughs> it's, it's an honor in so many ways. Um, thank, Ahmed, thank you. First of all, let me begin by, by thanking you for, for once again organizing this particular panel on such an important day. Uh, we have the University of Essex, the Human Rights Center has been marking this day uh, for several years now with, with panels just like this one, which have brought together, assembled a, a truly remarkable and internationally renowned um, team panel of, of, of people and experts who in their own different ways and, and interconnected ways are going to speak to today's particular topic and subject. Um, we have an hour and another hour and 20 minutes or so, um, so we can concentrate thoroughly on these on these complicated uh, and, and, uh, and in some cases controversial questions and issues. Each of the panelists was going to have an opportunity to speak for around about 10 to 12 minutes. You will then, people attending this particular event, and thank you so much, of course, for joining us, will have an opportunity to, to raise questions um, of the panelists. If you could do so after each of the, the panelists has finally finished speaking, that would be really helpful um, to me. I'll be chairing this particular session uh, and putting those questions that you set to the panelists in, in due course. Hopefully, We'll be able to put all of the questions that you raise to the panelists. Um, if, however, that's not the case, there sometimes there are very many more questions than, than can be answered, then, then please forgive me if I don't uh, manage to get to your particular question. Okay, let me start by, by just very briefly introducing uh, the panelists and their particular credentials uh, in order of, of panelist presentations as well. So I'd like to, to, to welcome Professor Nazila Ghanaya as the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief. She is Professor of International Human Rights Law and Director of the MSc in International Human Rights Law at the University of Oxford. Prior to that, she was Senior Lecturer at the University of London from 2000 to 2006, and she has also previously taught in the People's Republic of China in the early 90s. She has researched and published widely in international human rights law and served as consultant to numerous agencies. Through her nearly 30-year career, though her nearly 30-year career has been rooted in academia, Ms. Ghanir's academic work is often connected with multilateral practice in international human rights law. She has contributed actively to networks interested in freedom of religion or belief and its interrelationship with other human rights and advised states and other stakeholders. Naz, welcome to Essex. Thank you so much for agreeing to contribute to this particular panel. Um, thank you very much, Andrew Ahmad. Uh, sorry to be informal and go with first names. It's a real pleasure to be with you and with colleagues. Um, I thought I would tackle this uh, vast topic by looking at what 
um, tolerance and intolerance often um, engenders uh, more specifically in relation to the mandate of the special rapporteur on freedom of religion and belief. I do so with particular humility since Ahmad, uh, Professor Shahid was the mandate holder for six years and only just stepped down. And it's only the first uh, four months that I've been in this role. Um, so what does intolerance raise uh, in the sphere of the mandate of the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief? I thought by adding this perspective on it, uh, then in our discussions with the, the, the distinguished set of panelists uh, and chair and host, uh, we can discuss it in a, in a richer way. Um, I'll try to look at the negative aspects as well as the positive aspects of uh, the promotion of diversity, inclusion of harmony and difference in order to meet um, the scope of, of the ambition you set out for this panel. It certainly won't be exhaustive, but I hope it will be a humble contribution to, to the discussion. Well, the question of intolerance is core to the mandate of the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief. In fact, it was the title of the mandate um, from 1986 until 2000. It was called the Special Rapporteur on uh, religious intolerance. It only changed its name uh, at the request of the then special rapporteur, Professor Abdul Fattah Amor, um, where he asked that it be changed the special rapporteur on freedom of religion or belief, and this was endorsed by the General Assembly. The resolution that creates um, the mandate asks uh, that the mandate holders seek to promote uh, the adoption of measures at national, regional, and international levels to ensure the promotion and protection of freedom of religion or belief, uh, to identify existing and emerging obstacles to the enjoyment of this right, present recommendations to try and overcome those obstacles, to examine incidents and governmental actions uh, that are incompatible and recommend re remedial measures, and to apply a gender perspective. And there have been three uh, reports of the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief uh, in the past 36 years of the, the mandate um, that have been specifically concerned with gender. So uh, what about the core instruments that frame and inform the mandate? Uh, these are Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 18 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the 1981 Declaration on the Elimination of All Forms of Intolerance and of Discrimination Based on Religion or Belief. I think it's pertinent to look at uh, what uh, the Declaration says regarding intolerance. Um, this Declaration, interestingly enough, took 21 years to draft. It is a very short Declaration of just eight articles. Um, we It was co uh, conjoined with um, racial intolerance and discrimination, which we know within three years led to the adoption of the UN human, the first UN Human Rights Treaty, uh, the Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. But freedom of religion or belief did not yield a binding um, treaty. Uh, it, it remains um, as a, a declaration, but there has been a mandate that seeks to advance the objectives of that declaration. In that declaration, it talks about intolerance and discrimination based on religion or belief, and it defines this as any distinction, exclusion, restriction, or preference based on religion or belief, and having as its purpose or effect, um, or as its effect, nullification or impairment of the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise of human rights and fundamental freedoms on an equal basis. So intolerance and discrimination become deeply integrated already at, at this stage regarding freedom of religion or belief. What does it actually look like? <laughs> um, so first of all, we should note that the intolerance and discrimination that we are talking about uh, relates to thought, conscience, religion, and belief. That includes non-religion and non-belief. If there is such a thing, I, I some, I doubt that there is such a thing as non-belief. It might be non-religious belief, but I think everybody uh, has a realm of conscience and, and holds uh, some things uh, coherently and cogently in, in, and dearly in their lives. So the scope is very much broad. Safety and security is essential uh, in ensuring that there is no intolerance and discrimination on grounds of 
uh, religion or belief. So, for example, the special rapporteur in 2004 on a country visit to Romania um, outlined that, you know, acts of intolerance and religious violence, whether they are perpetrated by states or in this case, uh, highlighting um, perpetration by non-state individuals or groups, um, you know, must be tackled to ensure that religious minorities be able to exercise their freedom of religion or belief in safety. Another aspect of intolerance would be intolerance in the law, intolerance in registration or non-recognition before the law. So these are different forms of institutionalized intolerance and discrimination on the grounds of religion or belief. Um, and alongside that, we need to ensure that there are legal remedies and redress where violations occur. Equality before the law, uh, something that is uh, very much um, denied many around the world. Um, of course, we also have incitement to discrimination, hostility or violence or intimidation on grounds of religion or belief. Um, I, I think others may be addressing atrocity crimes and mass violations, and these are shared across the spectrum and not specific to religion or belief, uh, but certainly suffered by religion, religious and belief minorities around the world. An aspect that is uh, more specific to this freedom is uh, the right to change religion or belief. Um, I'm sure it has its parallels across the human rights spectrum, uh, but is uh, something that is uh, very much uh, denied uh, in religion or belief. There may be heavy penalties, they may stretch from um, uh, brainwashing or, or trying to compel the person to return to their original religion or belief. There might be th the threat of the death penalty or torture uh, along and, you know, all the way uh, across to civil and political um, exclusions because of apostasy or change or religion, change of religion or belief. This is despite the fact that it is very clear in international human rights instruments that there should be no coercion in matters of religion or belief, no coercion that impairs the freedom to have a religion or belief of one's choice. Um, then we can look at intolerance uh, regarding worship, observance, teaching and practice. These are really the headline manifestations or expressions of freedom of religion or belief that are detailed in other instruments and should be seen in a, in, with a very broad lens. For example, um, you know, the, the right to uh, gather together, the right to worship together, the right to have places for um, gathering and upholding uh, religion or belief, charitable, um, you know, um, institutions, uh, educational activities. These are just some of the examples. Uh, Professor Shahid, in his final report to the UN General Assembly, uh, highlighted a very important um, aspect of freedom of religion or belief, with it, which is indigenous peoples and freedom of religion or belief, uh, something that had been um, long neglected and takes a different form. It might not be the familiar form of um, teaching observance, worship and practice, but uh, crucial nevertheless. Um, the culture of tolerance and peace the General Assembly has called for in 2021 uh, should be based on respect for human rights and for the diversity of religions and beliefs. Um, and uh, within that, the General Assembly expresses concern about uh, violence directed against places of worship, attacks on these places, sites and shrines, and recognizes that all of these are violations of international law. The important thing about freedom of religion or belief um, is that of course, it is not only private and alone, but it is a right that is to uh, be enjoyed with others and also in public. The manifestation of freedom of religion and belief may be limited by states, but only according to the st a strict understanding and application of the limitations regime. So we need to ask, was the interference um, necessary? Was the measure for the restriction um, uh, the least restrictive? Was the measure proportionate? 
Um, and uh, did, was it based on any discrimination? So, you know, after having established that the restriction is established in law, these are all the other considerations that must be upheld. Um, there may also be intolerance regarding religious symbols, especially in public. So much has been, um, there, there is much concern and rightfully so about uh, headdress, head coverings, et cetera. Um, another area where a lot of intolerance uh, may crop up is regarding the right to promote religion or belief or non-religion. Um, and we know that proselytism or the right to promote religion or belief should uh, is, is rejected by international law if there are inducements, improper inducements, if it is forced, if it is coercive, if it is exploitative. Um, but other than those restrictions, there is the right to promote uh, and to seek to persuade others. Um, but the question um, that was raised by one special rapporteur is, what if it disturbs the, the, the existing culture of religious tolerance? What, uh, what if there is an existing environment where religious tolerance is already challenged? Um, what if it is considered disrespectful in, in that population? Um, these are where it becomes, uh, faces a lot of obstacles. Um, regardless of our freedom of, uh, re regardless of our thought conscience, religion or belief, we should be able to enjoy our full human rights um, on an equal basis to others. Um, we should be free of, um, violations, whether carried out by government or non-government actors, and the 1981 declaration upholds this. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so let me run through this a little bit more, but um, a 2001 report by the UN Special Rapporteur, uh, subsequent to the destruction of the Bamiyan statutes, statues, uh, calls for a culture of tolerance and respect for the for the diversity of religions and for religious sites uh, in order that all of these be recognized as important aspects of a collective heritage of humankind. Um, in 2001, the then UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief held an international consultative conference on school education and gave some very concrete examples of how to promote tolerance providing teachers and students with voluntary opportunities for exchanges with counterparts, uh, facilitating study abroad, strengthening a non-discriminatory perspective in the field of education, ensuring equality between men and women in the field of education, and taking measures against all forms of intolerance and discrimination. So we're already moving from the negative aspects to the positive aspects. At the, uh, the year that the mandate was founded was 1986, and there was already recognition by the special rapporteur of the important role of civil society and the media in this field as well. More recently, in 2021, um, the UN General Assembly recognized that um, th we need to promote through education and other means mutual understanding, tolerance, non-discrimination and respect in all matters relating to freedom of traditional belief. Um, in order to, uh, for society at large to have a deeper and better understanding of diversity of religions and beliefs in its history, traditions, languages, and cultures. Um, so let me just conclude by saying that the question of tolerance and freedom of religion or belief is multidimensional. It's rich and it's rightly on multiple fronts. It includes the individual and collective aspects. It includes the familiar and the less familiar, uh, the comfortable and the uncomfortable, um, and uh, the sharing uh, of freedom of religion and belief. Thank you very much for your time. Nes, thank you. Thank you for, for adhering to the time restraints. Um, much appreciated. Thank you uh, again for, for a, very, a very clear introduction and, and setting the framework for, for this particular discussion. Um, Tolerance is a is a virtue. I think courage is also a virtue. So I think we should also acknowledge your courage in taking on um, what is such a such a difficult uh, and, and challenging mandate. So, so thank you for for doing that. Uh, if I can ask Victor, Victor, please, if you can turn on your camera, because 
you've also, I'm sure, required a great deal of courage in, in taking on the mandate that, that you have uh, and the role that you have within the UN. I'm going to, to briefly introduce you um, and then the floor will be yours for about 10 minutes or so. Um, so Mr. Victor Madrigal Bolos, uh, our second speaker today is a Costa Rican jurist and for our purposes, perhaps more importantly, the UN Special Rapporteur on Protection Against Violence and Discrimination Based on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. In this capacity, Victor assesses the implementation of international human rights law, raises awareness, engages in dialogue with all relevant stakeholders, and provides advisory services, technical assistance, capacity building to help address violence and discrimination against persons on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity. He is a visiting researcher at the Harvard Law School's Human Rights Program. He will be in residence at Harvard Law School from July 2019 to December 2023. Until June 2019, he served as the Secretary General of the International Rehabilitation Council for Torture Victims. Victor, thank you again for joining us and agreeing to contribute to our panel today. The floor is yours for, as I say, for the next 10 to 12 minutes or so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, and I hope that you can hear me well. We can. We can hear you. Wonderful. And I apologize that I'm not turning on my camera. Courtesy of a very, very late arrival of my plane, I'm actually in a moving situation, so I don't want to make you all dizzy. But I want to thank you, Andrew, uh, Ahmed, uh, Nazila, for uh, already your introductory remarks and setting what is uh, a very rich discussion already. And uh, of course, for the center for this invitation that uh, greatly honors me and that I think relates to a conversation that is of great importance. Um, I think that uh, a great job has already been done at setting the stage for describing a situation in which the idea and the ideal of tolerance as a way to understand the realm in which rights are enjoyed by all to the extent that is necessary and that is fair, uh, it's also connected with the robust terminology that exists in relation to non-discrimination, equality, equal protection of the law and the other elements of the human rights-based approach. And I'm, I'm very much hoping uh, to speak from my vantage point uh, in relation to the mandate that I carry out, but also in relation to the extremely um, uh, interesting and oftentimes uncomfortable, to use Nazila's uh, words, um, uh, uh, tensions and counter tensions that exist in public narratives between different rights, including, of course, the right to freedom of religion and belief and freedom from discrimination and violence based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And I find that a very rich realm of exploration to ensure that we are able to provide new narratives, new concepts, new building blocks in the human rights discourses of today. The mandate of the independent expert, the mandate that I have the honor of carrying out, was created um, only in 2016. It's a very recent mandate. Uh, and the mandate has been requested to address multiple intersecting and aggravated forms of violence and discrimination faced by persons uh, based on their sexual orientation and their gender identity. Now, one of the elements uh, that as to the methodology becomes immediately evident when one studies this task is that analyzing root causes requires a multi-dimensional assessment of all factors, including historical, sociocultural, political, and anthropological that have concurred to create an understanding of what is perceived as a norm in relation to gender, sex, sex and sexual desire in a given place and at a given time. And so, Two of the methodological principles of my mandate are dialogue amongst uh, all stakeholders, but also very importantly, the implementation of intersectional approaches that recognize that in creating particular experiences of discrimination or privilege, concur many identities that reunite in one body uh, to actually place persons in those lived experiences of empowerment or privilege 
or discrimination and uh, disenfranchisement. And I think this is particularly important when we examine and explore the notion of tolerance, because as Nazila was already mentioned, it is so inextricably linked to the idea of non-discrimination and to the idea of equality and equal protection of the law. Um, I wanted to uh, note in relation to this issue that part of the dilemmas and the problematic that we face when dealing with these issues is the alleged um, uh, counterposition or the alleged tension between sets of rights or different rights that operates so constantly in relation to public discourse. And uh, it is for this reason that my next report is going to precisely examine the alleged uh, tensions between freedom of religion and belief and freedom from violence uh, based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Now, the idea of um, the way that rights not only exist, but also exist within limits and limitations is not one that is new, but it's one that is subject constantly to new challenges in populistic, polarizing, and political debate. And we see that very often applied today in uh, efforts to galvanize political bases and that uh, claim that in the existence of full uh, acknowledgement of rights uh, for LGBT people, for example, there is infringement of rights and therefore an inherent intolerance in relation to the right to freedom of religion and belief and the manifestation of this right in public uh, spaces. And to me, uh, as Nazila was already inviting us to do, this is an area where we are bound to actually carry out further exploration to make sure that we understand what is the formula that allows um, the narratives that we are, uh, of course, able to discover at legal uh, political and social terms in relation to these issues. And I want in this moment to pay tribute to the visionary work of Ahmed Shahid when he was the special rapporteur and he carried out significant exploration uh, of these issues uh, through regional consultations and through his report that links to the issue of gender. Now, going a little bit more into the uh, subject matter of sexual orientation and gender identity as such, I wanted to share with you some of the considerations concerning social inclusion, which is one of the areas where my mandate has been most uh, focused. Uh, our uh, research shows that in all corners of the world, LGBT people continue to remain excluded and marginalized and that violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity are perpetrated in a wide variety of public and private settings against LGBT persons. As I have mentioned all over the world, political campaigns, parliamentary debates, and public manifestations reveal social prejudice and misconceptions about the nature and moral character of LGBT persons. We are also seeing the rise of ultra-conservative, ultra-nationalist groups reclaiming so-called identities at the expense of sexual and gender minorities, challenging advances and preventing the development of laws and policies inclusive of LGBT people. LGBT issues are often instrumentalized by political and religious leaders <coughs> Pardon me, as a threat to national cohesion culture and tradition, in particular during periods of political and socioeconomic instability. LGBTI persons become the quote-unquote other, the quote-unquote foreign, whose sole purpose is to undermine the national project from within. All these elements impact on the social inclusion of LGBT individuals and negatively affect the respect and their ability to enjoy access to healthcare, education, housing, employment, political participation, and personal security and freedom from violence. And in this relation, my findings come over and over again to a series of 
basic findings in relation to root causes. One of them is that there are institutional drivers that are in operation to actually ensure this social exclusion. Those drivers are criminalization or the idea that criminal law ought to be applied to outlaw the very uh, existence of same-sex intimacy, pathologization or the idea that LGTB uh, life uh, and lives are in themselves to be considered ill, uh, a notion greatly enhanced by uh, the unfortunate inclusion of these identities in international classification of diseases. And finally, the idea that LGBT uh, lives are sinful or somehow immoral and therefore contrary to um, the good purposes in the social fabric. I think that a lot needs to be worked in relation to the idea of how tolerance relates to the basic notion of respect and non-discrimination and equality as already highlighted by Nazila. And in my view, of course, great strides have been already been achieved in relation to this, including of course, the progressive dismantlement of colonial era legislations in relation to criminalization and the extraction of uh, homosexuality, lesbianism, and gender dysphoria of international classification of diseases by the World Health Organization and different medical organizations. I am hoping, of course, that our joint work leads me and gives me better clues as to how to explore um, the way in which these notions, including the active work in tolerance, is going to further help me in the identification and addressing these institutional drivers. Uh, and again, very much uh, ascribing to the idea that in the notion of tolerance, there is very much um, a message, uh, a concept and a social uh, construction that embodies and it's deeply intertwined uh, with non-discrimination, equality uh, before the law and respect of human rights. Thank you very much, Andrew. Victor, thank you, and, and thank you for, for, for delivering your um, your presentation literally whilst in whilst in motion. Um, I, hope, I hope your journey is, is smooth. Um, and, and thank you for such an interdisciplinary perspective upon upon the challenges confronting LGBTQ plus people uh, and, and upholding and defending their rights. So thank you very much. Okay, let's move on without further ado to our third speaker, uh, Maria Westergren. Um, who, as I say, I'm going to briefly introduce, and then Maria, you'll have 10 to 12 minutes to to um, to present your your um, your presentation. Ms. Maria Westergren is a political affairs officer with the UN Office on Genocide Prevention and the Responsibility to Protect. She supports the mandate of the Special Advisors on the Prevention of Genocide and on the Responsibility to Protect, which, among other tasks, are mandated to advance national, regional, and international efforts to prevent genocide war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. A particular area of, of focus in Maria's work is in the implementation of the Global Strategy and Plan of Action Against Hate Speech. She also contributes to the Office's thematic work on human rights and public international law in particular. Ms. Westergren has worked as a human rights officer for the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights in Uganda, South Sudan, and Switzerland where she works on advancing human rights treaties and mechanisms at the national level, as well as on human rights monitoring and fact-finding. Maria, thank you again. Welcome to, to, um, welcome to Essex. Welcome, thank you so much for agreeing to contribute to this panel. Um, the floor is yours for the next 10 to 12 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me start by, by thanking the organizers for inviting the UN Office on Genocide Prevention and Responsibility to Protect to be part of the discussion and the panel today. Uh, and also thank you from my side. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be part of such a distinguished uh, panel and, and to listen to, to the other speakers. Um, uh, in the introduction, the, the mandate of my office where I come from was, was already mentioned. Uh, it's the UN Office on Genocide Prevention and Responsibility to Protect. Uh, and we work globally on the prevention of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. 
Uh, we are also within the UN system, the focal point on countering and addressing hate speech, and we coordinate implementation of a UN strategy and plan of action on hate speech that was adopted uh, or launched rather in 2019 by the UN Secretary General. So I will focus my intervention today on the work that we do as an office and the work that the broader UN system is doing on, on countering and addressing hate speech. Uh, and of course, how that contributes uh, in the broader sense to promoting inclusion, non-discrimination and, and tolerance. That's the, the focus of, of this uh, panel. So uh, the strategy and plan of action, I mentioned it was launched in 2019 by the Secretary General, uh, and it was really in response to, to his concern um, uh, and reports that within the UN system, uh, including and especially at national level, uh, of the increase, uh, rise and, and use of hate speech uh, and, and the impact it was, was having on the work uh, that the UN uh, is doing. Uh, and in particular, um, the spread of hate speech online. Uh, of course, I think we all know that hate speech is not a new phenomenon, but the, the impact that social media uh, and other online platforms have had in exacerbating and allowing hate speech to be spread in a way that wasn't possible before uh, is a new phenomenon. Uh, and the UN strategy uh, was really um, trying to respond to, to this uh, emerging trend. Uh, we also saw and um, uh, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, how hate speech and related disinformation was used really to, to also uh, stigmatize uh, and target uh, with hate uh, particular communities. Uh, and of course, the, the strategy on hate speech looks particularly uh, at those that are mostly targeted by, by hate speech, uh, the victims, uh, and which often includes minority communities, uh, refugees, migrants, uh, and many others uh, that the previous speakers have, have also highlighted in their, in their interventions. Uh, so the strategy uh, of the UN recognizes that hate speech uh, is in itself an attack on tolerance, inclusion, diversity, and human rights norms and principles, which of course are all fundamental to the work uh, that we do at the UN and to the mandate that we have. Uh, but it also recognizes that if hate speech is not addressed, uh, it undermines social cohesion, uh, it feeds distrust, and it can escalate into more serious issues of concern, including hate crimes, uh, but also violence. And uh, of course, in the most serious cases, and that we know as the, the office that works on atrocity prevention, that hate speech can be both a precursor uh, and, a, and a trigger of atrocity crimes. Um, and if you look at previous uh, instances of such crimes, in particular genocide, hate speech and incitement uh, have often been uh, a precursor uh, of that. So in order to uh, effectively address hate speech, the, the UN strategy takes a holistic approach. Uh, it, it emphasizes a uh, uh, what we sometimes refer to as a whole of society approach. So to look at the impact that hate speech is having on the victims that are being targeted uh, by the hate, but also on society more broadly. So how it may impact on, on peace, non-discrimination and inclusion. Uh, it also emphasizes looking at uh, the root causes of hate. Uh, and this is really recognizing that hate speech is of course a, a manifestation uh, of, of other issues, including discrimination, division, whatever it may be. Uh, hate speech is also very context specific, but it emphasizes really the importance of understanding what those root causes are uh, and addressing also those uh, to sustainably and, and in a long-term perspective, being able to, to address um, hate speech. Um, the strategy itself is built around 13 commitments of action, and these are really the commitments of, of uh, the UN system for what it will do more to, to counter and address hate speech in the work that we do uh, at national, at regional, but also at international level. Uh, the commitments speak to these two objectives of addressing hate speech, both from a root cause and an impact uh, perspective. Uh, it looks at uh, counter narratives, uh, how to promote the voices of those who are trying to speak out against hate speech, 
how to better understand the phenomenon um, and integrate it into programs uh, that the UN uh, does throughout the world. Uh, the strategy is also grounded in several core principles and I would just flag one of the very important ones here today, um, which is the right to freedom of opinion and expression and really prioritizing uh, in everything that we do to counter and address hate speech, uh, um, that it's done in line with international human rights and in particular freedom of opinion and expression. And with this, the UN strategy really emphasizes the importance of promoting uh, more speech. So counter narratives, for example, uh, not less uh, as the best way to, to address hate speech. Uh, and in uh, and only in those cases um, that reaches the threshold of incitement as set out under international human rights law uh, um, is it uh, when we talk about prohibition uh, of, of incitement speech. And in this, uh, um, so maybe let me move to, to the implementation uh, of the strategy. Uh, and one of the key ways that, that we as an office uh, and the UN system more broadly uh, promotes the implementation of this strategy is, of course, uh, by working with uh, UN uh, country teams across the world and supporting the implementation of the strategy at national level. Uh, we also try to promote the, the what we call the, the, the other speech, the counter speech, promoting positive narratives uh, earlier this year. Um, through the UN Department of Global Communication, there was a, a global campaign launched on no to hate uh, that really tries to emphasize uh, what, I, what I've just mentioned, uh, the dangers of hate um, and what the UN is doing to address it, what are the responsibility of different actors and what each individual can also do to, uh, to, to address hate speech or to not uh, disseminate uh, hate. Uh, another key aspect uh, for us, of course, I mentioned at the start that this strategy came about in particular um, in response to the acceleration of hate speech as, uh, that have come with, with online social media platforms. So one of the key areas of intervention for us has been engaging with tech and social media platforms uh, on current efforts that are there to address hate speech online, but also what more can be done in this regard in line with the UN strategy. Um, we have regular engagement with the companies and, and we have uh, actually just last week together with the University of Essex Center on, on Big Data and Human Rights and with Dr. Shahid, uh, organized a round table with, uh, with these companies uh, where we really try to emphasize uh, uh, their role in this regard and how we can cooperate uh, to strengthen efforts to tackle uh, online hate speech. Uh, uh, within the UN system, um, there's also been efforts by the General Assembly. There was a resolution adopted last year, 2021, uh, that created an international day for countering hate speech. Uh, and this is another avenue for, for raising awareness and really emphasizing the importance of, of, of addressing this, both from the, the, the root cause and the impact uh, perspective. Maybe just one uh, other area of work I wanted to highlight because it also is mentioned in the UNESCO declaration on, on tolerance that is this part of this discussion today is the role of education. Uh, the role of education is recognized as one of the commitments in the strategy, in particular, the potential of education to address root causes of hate speech. Um, and it is also something prioritized by the secretary general when he launched the strategy he called for a global conference to be organized uh, by my office and by UNESCO to examine uh, how education can be uh, a tool for addressing hate speech. Uh, this conference was held uh, last year in October, uh, convened by the SG um, and organized, as I mentioned, by UNESCO and my office. It, it resulted in a set of recommendations that really highlight the many different ways in which education can play a positive um, uh, role in, in addressing hate, but also in promoting inclusion, in addressing uh, and promoting uh, non-discrimination and tolerance in this comprehensive uh, manner. Uh, and we are working currently uh, with UNESCO in developing a specific guidance to kind of unpack these recommendations from the conference uh, into more actionable and, and, 
and, and practical ways to, to implement them through education systems, uh, formal and, and informal. Um, that will be another uh, tool for the implementation of the, of the strategy. So maybe just uh, in conclusion, uh, um, of course, uh, uh, I mentioned before the importance of, of the different actors and, and the UN strategy really recognizes that tackling hate speech is not something that uh, the UN uh, can do on its own. Uh, it's uh, uh, a lot of actors that play a critical role in this regard. Uh, member states have the primary responsibility to address hate speech, of course, uh, but we also know the significant role played by, by civil society, by media, um, by private sectors, uh, by religious leaders. Uh, our office have a specific program and we engage uh, quite a lot also with religious leaders. Um, and uh, they all have a, a really key role to play. And this is also something that uh, the strategy really emphasizes uh, and that in the implementation of the, the strategy, we really also prioritize convening and working with all of these different partners. And it comes down, of course, also in the end to what each individual can do to, to address hate speech uh, in their own engagement uh, as well. I'll stop there, thank you. Maria, thank you. Thank you for, for, for sharing with us and, and, and sort of bringing into the public realm, as it were, the, the behind the scenes work that your office is, is undertaking, um, the crucial behind the scenes work that your office is undertaking. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the, you know, the vital role, um, depressingly, the vital role that social media plays uh, in, in amplifying, exponentially amplifying hate and hate speech and, and intolerance um, across the across social media networks and of course the effects that has upon wider society. Therefore, it's incredibly fitting um, that we are able to welcome our final, our final guest, our final panelist today, um, Professor Farahani, who is a, has expertise in this particular area. Uh, I shall introduce Professor Farahani and then, uh, and then in, in now a conventionally established pattern, we'll, we'll pass the floor over for 10 minutes or so presentation. So Professor Nita Farahani is a leading scholar on the ethical, legal, and social implications of emerging technologies. She is the, she is the Robinson, Robinson O. Everett Distinguished Professor of Law and Philosophy at Duke Law School, the founding director of Duke Science and Society, the faculty chair of the Duke MA in Bioethics and Science Policy, and principal investigator of SLAP Lab. Nita, thank you so much for joining us. Um, the floor is, is yours for the next 10 to 12 minutes. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for uh, inviting me and to this important conversation on this um, very important day. It's such a pleasure to, to speak with you today. <clears throat> what I want to focus my remarks on <clears throat> are an aspect that um, I worked with Ahmed on for his report last October on freedom of thought. Um, and thinking about the implications of the coming age of neurotechnology um, for tolerance and discrimination. And, and I want to start by saying that I think that this is a, a particularly difficult and timely topic. The reason is that much of what we do as humans um, to make assessments and regard for individuals is, is based on their cognitive and affective states and abilities. So, for example, we make determinations on educational achievements and opportunities on hiring and occupational decisions regularly and often based on the cognitive and emotional and affective abilities of individuals. Um, and in, in related areas like the use of, for example, genetic information to make decisions about individuals, we regularly talk about the risk of genetic discrimination to limit access to information about individuals. Um, and we worry about categorizing, stigmatizing, identifying, or discriminating against groups of people based on their genetic information. And um, this is for four main reasons that we really recognize the kind of concerns, which is the fact that the genetic constitution of an individual is outside of their control and is due largely to moral luck in life. Um, the genetic information is propensity information. So trying to make predictions about people based on um, a propensity is dangerous in getting it wrong and being intolerant and in being deterministic about who people are and how we should treat them. Um, the third is that there's a tendency toward 
reductive determinations about people. Um, there's a, an unfortunate both history of believing in genetic determinism and modern day application of um, eugenics against groups of individuals based on their genetic or ethnic heritage. So it's critical that we create protections for people that respect human dignity and autonomy, but also enable them to share information, um, biometric and biological information about themselves to, to gain true insights and health insights that could benefit humanity. When it comes to the brain, which is the area that I've been focusing a lot of my research on recently, um, and I have a forthcoming book on the topic of the battle for your brain, um, the reason that I'm focusing on this area so much right now is that we are seeing a, a major move across society toward investing heavily in developing neurotechnologies that can be used by all of us, um, neural interface technologies that could enable us to interact with all of the rest of our technology without the use of our traditional peripheral devices like a mouse and a keyboard. Um, to use brain computer interface technology, whether in the form of ear pods or headphones or simple headbands or electrodes, small tattoos that could decode the information in our brains. And while this offers great promise to be able to understand the human brain, to be able to solve so many of the afflictions that cause human suffering from mental health issues to neurological disorders and dysfunction, it also raises a significant potential, much like genetic information, to make determinations about individuals, to become increasingly intolerant of differences between the cognitive and affective states of individuals. Um, and so we need to be thinking about safeguards for individuals with respect to their freedom of thought, their right to cognitive liberty, their right to self-determination over their brains and mental experiences, but also an important aspect of human rights to protect individuals from intolerance that will grow from our increasing ability to decode not just um, what a person expresses to other people, but also their very thoughts, which are so bound up with their identity. Um, and so there are additional concerns that we need to safeguard because first, um, much like genetic information, the cognitive, affective, and even risks of neurological disease, dysfunction, or even neuroatypicality is outside of the control of an individual. And much like genetic information is very much um, afforded to individuals based on moral luck, not something that they've chosen or opted into. The second is that neurological information, much like genetic information also consists of a tremendous amount of propensity information. That is a probability that a person will act or behave in a particular way over time. Um, it includes manifested information, that is how they are behaving and what their current um, brain looks like, their current cognitive and emotional abilities, um, and their current cognitive and affective states. This propensity information includes the future likelihood, for example, of developing neurological diseases like mental illnesses or degenerative diseases like ALS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease, and probabilistic information about um, their cognitive and emotional abilities in the future. It also includes traits such as their current neurological diseases, their current neuroatypicality or variations between individuals. For example, a person who's on the autism spectrum as opposed to being somebody who falls within the neurotypical category um, and their cognitive abilities to perform certain tasks. It also includes um, what an individual may be thinking, feeling, or visualizing, and we're already seeing a great deal of intolerance um, by governments, for example, who are mandating um, either students or workers wear these different headsets to decode their brain functioning during their workday, during their educational day, even trying to test not just for differences between individuals, but political ideology um, to persecute individuals based on their thoughts. The third is that there is a concern about the seductive allure of neuroscience. There's an over attribution to neuroscience based explanations, and this seems to be particularly concerning more in the use of information about the brain than in other areas, which means that our likelihood of being intolerant 
based on what we learn about the brain, maybe even more entrenched based on um, the kinds of associations we make there. Artificial intelligence is also being used to interpret and decipher neurological states, which introduces additional risks of bias and lack of transparency. It's critical that we create protections for individuals that safeguard them against unique forms of neurological discrimination to respect human autonomy and dignity, but also to give people the necessary protections against misuse of their neurological data that will enable them to safely share that data. With shared data, we may gain critical insights that we need to really advance to humanity. As neurotechnologies become more pervasive throughout society, we see its increasing use already in contexts as varied as education, play, and work. Increasingly in educational settings, students are being asked to wear neurotechnologies throughout their educational day to study their attention, their mind wandering, or even to make assessments about their learning styles um, and capabilities. There's a, there's a risk of a reductionist view of students, of workers, of gamers who are using this technology with regard that regards them as their neurological propensities divorced from their actual performance and a whole child approach. There's also too little known today about the correlations between what we're learning from neurotechnology and outcomes which makes the risk of discrimination and intolerance between students based on the assumptions we make about correlations between say attention and behavior. In work, we're increasingly requiring people to be monitored using neurotechnology that monitors their attention for their fatigue levels and for their workloads. While there can be legitimate reasons to do so, such as increasing societal safety by detecting fatigue and workers operating, for example, heavy machinery. It also means that we're making hiring, firing, and promotion decisions based on um, direct neurological measures of individuals, which may or may not correlate with their overall performance and may lead us to be increasingly intolerant about particular people who have differences in their brain structures and function than others. There's similarly a risk that as employers start to see, for example, cognitive decline of their employees over time or early evidence of development of neurological diseases that employers can use this information to preemptively fire an employee for reasons that we ordinarily would find intolerant and impermissible. There's a risk as we introduce neurotechnology into play, even for example, in how we judge beauty and art or music, that we will choose and determine what is beautiful art based on what causes our brain to react in particular ways, even if that's different from how we would judge or make attributions about what is good in art, pleasing in music or otherwise. The reason I think that this is one of the most challenging aspects of defining or, or clarifying existing human rights and freedom of thought that are impacted by neurotechnologies is because the difficulty where we uh, of being able to draw the lines between permissible inferences about the mental states of others, something that we do all day, every day, and impermissible ones that we think are intolerant and inappropriate that diminish the dignity and the autonomy of individuals. I think that our historical regulation of genetic information provides us a guide, but is also different. Genetic information is static and more probabilistic. Neurological information, as I said, covers everything from probabilistic information about diseases or um, differences that will manifest over time to currently manifested cognitive and affective abilities, mental states, as well as mental illnesses and differences. As we begin to think about new challenges for tolerance and intolerance that are posed by neurotechnologies, I believe we can't address this as a single static concept that there aren't unique neuro rights against discrimination that we need, but a mapping of the different kinds of information and the different kinds of inferences that we will make over time, the different uses that we will make from neurotechnology and deciding the unique risk that those pose for greater intolerance or discrimination against individuals. The more probabilistic the information and more divorced from the use of information for a legitimate basis for judging people, the more likely it's a discriminatory application or risk posed by neurotechnology. 
But as we define the risks of intolerance, we have to always keep in mind that we use cognitive and effective assessments of individuals all the time. We develop from the earliest stages of life, a theory of mind of others from the earliest stages of education and throughout the opportunities that individuals gain throughout life, we try to understand, interact, persuade others, even read what others are thinking. In short, I think the questions that neurological discrimination and tolerance bring to us about, um, and today is whether or not we need to define a new set of rights or whether or not we need to explore the existing boundaries of our existing rights and how they're challenged by neurotechnology, how we may have a greater risk of treating people, individuals or groups based on real or perceived neurological traits or conditions, neurological predispositions or neurological risk factors to health and disease traits or cognitive and affective states. And we're gonna have to define what a set of rights are as well as what a set of assumptions are that we can draw from this information over time. That's gonna require a lot of context specific understanding as we use neurotechnologies in work, in play by governments for development of our understanding of individuals and groups. And, and we're gonna to have to keep our eye on this area, an area that offers extraordinary promise to understand differences between individuals and to make sure that as we understand those differences, we don't use those as a justification for increasing intolerance of differences between each other. Thanks very much. And I look forward to the conversation. It's a thank you. I, I, I erroneously um, refer to your expertise as being in the realm of social media, your expertise, at least certainly this presentation is just so much more fascinating and so much more, more interesting and engaging than, than that. Um, presentation also was just so rich uh, and, and so thought provoking. I'm not someone personally who's particularly prone to anxiety or to fear, but, but um, much of what you said is, is uh, <laughs> causes, uh, would cause me to lose some sleep at night, I must, I must admit. Um, unfortunately, we have lost Victor. Victor is, is boarding a connecting flight. Um, so if I could ask uh, the remaining panelists to turn on their cameras and, and we have about 20 minutes or so to, uh, to, to, have, a, to have a discussion um, based upon questions that, we're coming, that are coming in through the Q&A. We have one already. If, we, if I could invite um, participants to, to set their questions through the Q&A, um, that, that would be great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna exercise uh, chair's privilege and, uh, and, and raise a more kind of general question, ultimately, really, but one that is that uh, I'm a philosopher by, by background, by training, this is uh, the kind of thing that, that, uh, that concerns me. And I, and I think it's a question and an issue that we have not often um, provided very satisfactory answers to. So, so here we go. This is a question really to, to, to each uh, and all of you, um, which is ultimately, what does tolerance, what does tolerance mean? to you, how would you define tolerance? How would you characterize tolerance uh, as an ideal? Does it, for example, does tolerance require positively affirming, recognizing, esteeming others as, as, having, um, as having particular value? Or is it more aligned with, with more conventional negative rights and duties, uh, i.e. Not, not actively promoting and supporting other people's um, commitments and, and ways of living, but, but, but agreeing to not seek to, to restrict them or to interfere them in, in any way. Um, really keen to hear, to hear the views of, of, of all of our panelists. Ahmed, likewise, very keen for, for your contributions uh, to this as well. Tolerance, what does it mean? <laughs> Discuss, it's a typical, um, typical student paper, but uh, yeah, over to you. Uh, I'll go first so that I can do Thanks. the simple observations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And allow the others to add to the richness. <laughs> At least that's my, the bet I'm going on. Uh, I mean, I think uh, tolerance, uh, and I'm no philosopher, but tolerance in human rights law must be tolerance light. It must be a, a, a very restricted and minimalistic set of tolerances, right? Uh, uh, even though we are falling well short of them on the global level, as everybody commented, but there is the tolerance that we are we are required as a minimum safety net that we have established as human rights law around the world as obligations uh, in order to respect. But I think that tolerance has to go beyond that. That you know, I, I may have uh, I, I have a student who's doing a defil on purity and disgust 
in relation to women's rights. So, you know, it, it may be that I respect all rights, even positively, uh, in, in my responsibilities as a fellow citizen or human being, uh, I am pushing the boundaries and, and ensuring that I'm trying to respect all human rights. But I may just deep inside have a sense of disgust, discomfort, kind of, um, well, at least it's not in my home. I, I may just have a residual discomfort within me, despite res formalistically respecting those rights. So, so I want to suggest that, you know, there, there will be um, a tolerance that I, will be a lifelong project and I will still not achieve, but hopefully that will be above and beyond uh, the human rights legal requirements. <laughs> so let me, but it has to be positive. I think even in those minimalistic state response, state obligations and other responsibilities, it has to be affirming. Um, uh, but let me let me stop there and leave the richness to the others. Yes, thank you. That was that was sufficiently rich. Thank you so much, um, Maria and or, or, Anita, or, or both. Did you you have a view on on what tolerance requires of us? Uh, I mean, I I would uh, of course agree with the with the special rapporteur, and also to emphasize what the UNESCO declaration uh, emphasizes on respect and and uh, appreciation of the richness and diversity of of culture. I think this should be the the starting point. Uh, it's also something that um, this office and and uh, through the the different uh, reports on responsibility to protect that have been issued by the Secretary General is often emphasized this idea of seeing um, um, uh, diversity as a strength and not as a weakness and 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 how to uh, um, have that as part of, of the efforts that we're doing and, and I think that again is where education has a, has a key role to, to play but definitely in the, the positive I would say. Thank you. Nita? I think it's a complicated question. So I agree with the, um, the, the answers that have come before me. I think um, part of why I offered the remarks that I gave is that as we think about tolerance, um, part of it is kind of the essential part of it is, is accepting people for who they are, um, accepting the dignity of others and not making um, discriminatory choices that distinguish between people that reflect an intolerance of difference. Um, and so uh, I think my, my worry is that we already have a, a great degree of intolerance of difference that we see across the world. Um, and part of that is based on assumptions of who others are uh, and a belief that those assumptions justify the intolerance of difference that and how we treat others. Um, I worry that when we turn to a field like science as a justification for intolerance of difference, um, that we feel almost as if we are right um, in those choices that we're making. We see that in the history of genetic eugenicism, where we look and we say in history, um, well, we see that there's an inferior genetic constitution um, and that justifies, that inferiority justifies our intolerance because what we are trying to do is what's best for humanity as a whole. Um, and we use science, which doesn't normatively tell us that, um, as a way to take comfort, uh, to blanket ourselves in justifications that we think are found in nature for that intolerance of difference. Um, and you know, part of why I worry about the growing field of neurotechnology, which I'm excited about because it can help us learn about differences, it can help us celebrate differences, it can help us treat differences that are dysfunctional and that cause suffering, is that we'll use it in a similar way to um, justify and take comfort in intolerance of difference and in, in punishing, in, um, in identifying, and then encouraging conformity to a norm. And so I think tolerance of difference um, or tolerance calls us to respect and celebrate differences between individuals rather than to identify and to push people toward conformity of a particular norm that we think 
um, that we that we believe and then we use justifications from different fields that don't have normative content as a basis for discriminating between people. Thank you. Thank you, Nisa. Nisa, I'm going to come straight to you by turning to the questions that we've received from the Q&A, because this one's specifically for you. Um, would you say that there's perhaps a relation between these new neurotechnologies and the risk they pose to tolerance, but to the right to privacy as well? Is there perhaps yes. a link between the right to privacy and tolerance? I, I think so. You know, I, so um, so I've proposed that that we ought to recognize a right to cognitive liberty as an international human right, um, and that that requires really an updating of our understanding of privacy to include mental privacy, freedom of thought to include, you know, the the protections um, against uh, reading our thoughts, punishing our thoughts, manipulating our thoughts. Um, and then a right to individual self-determination and self-access rather than just a collective political right of self-determination. And that right, I think, interrelates with tolerance, right? Because it's about um, recognizing, as I said, uh, you know, that the that the private thought of others are, are not only some a difference that we have to respect, but my fear again is that the more that we intrude upon the private rights of others, the more there will be a pressure toward conformity, an intolerance of difference, of um, ideological differences, of uh, grand novel ideas that are different, right? The, the seeds of humanity and differences are born in our thoughts. And the more people feel that those thoughts are being tracked and surveilled, the more that they don't have a right to privacy over those thoughts, the greater threat there is to, to conformity and against tolerance of difference, against celebration of differences. I think we have to ask Professor Shahid to comment too. <laughs> Sorry, Chair. No problem. That's fine. Ahmed, your uh, your no. views. And I was just going to go on the previous question actually uh, on the uh, question of tolerance. Please. I think the question you posed, Andrew, had a sort of binary in it, right? It's uh, either yeah. this or that, and I think that's precisely what we need to address in coping with tolerance. And I think uh, the response by the panelists really addressed that something centrist, um, as Nita was think was suggesting that part of the problem with intolerance is that the fear that sometimes we think we are asked to embrace a position of others mm -hmm. when we are invited to understand them. So understanding someone is about breaking down prejudices and stereotypes and really knowing them and respecting them certainly, but not conforming to their worldview as such. Mm -hmm. The fear that we are being asked to conform is also a cause for intolerance, or at least the fear drives intolerance. But that binary has to go. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I agree entirely, Ahmed, with, with that. I'm sure many of our panelists would likewise. This is a, you know, it's a, it's a horrendously complicated area, but sometimes the simplifications make things worse. Um, that, there was a question that came in very early, so hopefully this person is still with us, uh, and it's for all of you, uh, or any of you. In light of the importance of intersectionality raised by some of the panelists, how can separate mandates focused on specific issues apply intersectional approaches? Are there any recent examples of collaboration across mandate holders that demonstrate the viability effectiveness of such approaches within the UN system? Naz, you may want to, um, to take the first, first go at that particular question. Ahmed, again, very would welcome your, your views uh, on this. I, I think I'll step in for Victor here and just repeat <laughs> the fact that he, he flagged that his next report will be about freedom of religion or belief and uh, so he writes. So I think that's already intersectional. Um, uh, I find, and Ahmad demonstrated, that the FORB mandate is intersectional, not, not least because it, you know, it includes freedom of religion or belief, it includes non-discrimination on the grounds of thought, conscience, religion or belief, but also it needs to address violations or restrictions in the name of religion or belief. So, you know, the mandate holder is instructed to take uh, on board a gender lens. But, you know, when you look at the reports over the last 36 years, uh, so many of them have been intersectional. You know, one rapporteur talked about vulnerable populations and addressed, you know, refugees, uh, children, minorities, etc. There have been several reports on uh, religious or belief. There's been two specific reports on religious or belief minorities. There have been three reports on gender and freedom of religion and belief. 
there's been report uh, there has been um, thematic reports on child rights or the right to education which also included children and freedom of religion belief so yes by its very nature and by the fact that violations or restrictions can come in the name of religion or belief and, and the mandate needs to take it on board uh, this mandate has has always had that lens uh, collaborations include you know consultations in relation to those reports there was one time that the Human Rights um, Commission, was it Council or Commission, I can't remember, but instructed uh, the race and religion and belief mandate holder to cooperate and produce a report <laughs> together. Um, when it goes to country missions, um, that intersectional lens is very much alive. Uh, and then in the, uh, I've tried to push the boundaries of that to also reach out to UN agencies like UNHCR and UNDP and, um, you know, open up those channel of communications and the special advisor on the prevention of genocide joined the communications just in August regarding um, intolerance uh, on, on the basis of, vi sorry, violations um, uh, on the 22nd of August for commemorating the victims of violence. Uh, on the basis of religion or belief. So yes, you know, it's not sufficient. The UN needs to collaborate a lot more, but efforts are being made. Nice, nice, thank you. I know obviously that, that the mandate holders work closely together and have, have institutional forum that, that provides for that and facilitates that. But Ahmed, I wouldn't expect you to name names obviously, but have you had examples of you directly or indirectly where states, states parties have sought to kind of manipulate and exploit some of the, the, the gray areas between different man, mandate holders? Yes, that does happen. Uh, I, I think, um, I mean, the main motivation there is for, for countries to invite a reporter who for them is not uh, on a mandate threatening to them. In other words, you know, a soft landing of, of, for them. Or there are sometimes um, efforts by countries who may have a, a country man, mandate on it Try to bypass that inspection by asking a thematic reporter to, to, to come. That does happen, but but the reporters work together. I mean, in addition to what Nas said uh, just now, you know, the communications that, that are sent today as letters to government, they are by and large, perhaps some ninety percent, are joint communications, and these joint communications actually express the concerns, interests of those who, who joined them. Uh, and that therefore reflect a very, very broad, you know, spectrum of issues that, that they raise. And that discussion, that negotiating, that understanding, all has to do with looking at various aspects of how they, how their work intersect and, and overlap. So it's very much becoming a norm. It's very rare for reporters to work in silos these days, although there can be benefit in doing that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Maria, your work must also involve um, coordinating across different mandate holders. Did you want to address this particular question? And shed any light on it? Uh, sure. Uh, of course, we work closely with the various mandate holders that also relates to, to the office. And there's quite a lot of them that have been very active on the specific topic on countering and addressing hate speech. And, uh, and we have really benefited from that uh, collaboration and engagement. Um, but also uh, within the UN system, uh, the, the strategy is a UN system-wide strategy, so it, it really involves uh, all of the different entities and, and agencies um, coming together and, and addressing hate speech from the various point of views and, and um, uh, mandates that they, they have, uh, and some of them focus on particular um, uh, populations like UNHCR, other work on, uh, from their particular uh, focus like sustainable development. So in that sense also it's it's really um, uh, bringing all of these pieces uh, together to, to address it comprehensively I think is very important. Um, I'm going to follow up Maria with a question uh, directly for you. This is from our colleague uh, Professor Lars Wardle. Um, Lars asks can you point to examples of promoting successful counter narratives to hate speech and what were the factors that made for success in those cases? Um, I would say as an example of, of counter narratives, there is the campaign that, uh, that the UN launched earlier this year in the lead up to the first International Day for Countering Hate Speech. Um, it's a global campaign um, that's available in, in um, uh, multiple languages, uh, including the, the official UN languages. 
Uh, and its aim was to, first of all, raise awareness on the importance of tackling hate speech, uh, but also to, 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 kind, to try to raise awareness of what um, hate speech is, the impact that it has on, on communities affected and on societies uh, more largely. Uh, and also trying to prompt uh, action, what individuals can do to kind of stand up against hate speech. The, the campaign is hashtag no to hate. Uh, and I think that's um, uh, one example. Uh, it's a new, fairly new campaign. So I think impact we will see in maybe in the, the months to, to come. Uh, and we're also, uh, currently it's, it's also about bringing it, I think, to the country level uh, and having it in uh, available in in languages that people use at, at in different contexts, uh, and that's also where you can have more impact, I think. Thank you, thank you, Maria. I was question through the, through the chat regarding uh, the role that the culture and art has to play uh, in, in this in this field. So the question is: since understanding is essential in diluting the binary that Professor Ahmed was addressing. Is there any effort to include non-judicial solutions as part of the effort to promote tolerance by non-judicial, I mean, all cultural artifacts, books, film, theater, music performance, et cetera, given their role in promoting tolerance through sympathy and showcasing difference? Um, Naz, again, did you want to, to have, a, have a first pop at that and then need to be very keen to hear, hear your views on this as well? I think it's essential. Uh, I, I unfortunately have very little artistic talent, so I haven't, uh, there was a pre, uh, one of our predecessors was a brilliant jazz pianist, so uh, and he sometimes did reflect that <laughs> in some of the encounters he had. So no, uh, joking aside, I, I think it's critical. You know, the language of law doesn't move hearts and minds <laughs> quite as much. Well, maybe it moves our hearts and minds, but not everybody's. Uh, and I think it's uh, sometimes use the medium of film sometimes a song, sometimes a play. And there are some lawyers that also write plays, for example, because I think they get, get this frustration out of not convincing sufficiently through the language of, of human rights law. So I think, um, and, and you know, I think some of the best human rights debates in terms of uh, pushing the boundaries of our intolerance uh, and tolerance, um, I think some of the best debates uh, should happen after uh, an exchange of uh, arts and food uh, so that some of the bar our barriers have broken down and, and then um, we, we might have more receptivity. Um, yes, Faith for Rights is an initiative of trying to put forward the reality that whereas religion and belief have been used as grounds for restricting uh, the right, uh, rights, um, and limiting rights, uh, they have also played over millennia the opposite role. And uh, in order to open uh, minds and, and uh, respect for the dignity of others, and that purposefully uh, uses uh, art as, as well. But, you know, UNESCO, the, the Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights, there are other actors that use this far more actively. And I'll take this opportunity to... to, um, to, to, to to advertise our new MA pathway stream in the arts and, and human rights, which, uh, which is relatively novel. And again, trying to play precisely to those, recognize those the, the role that culture has to play, the arts have to play in I'm raising so awareness. I'm so glad that's materialized. I'd heard about some, some year, it's taken some years of development. How fantastic. Everything within the University of Essex and most universities takes much longer than it ought to do. And that was one of them. But yeah, we, we finally got there. Thank you, Naz. Uh, Nita, did you have, have views on, on the role of, of art and culture in promoting tolerance? Well, first of all, I would say it, it's played an important role. There, there's been, you know, within the U.S., for example, the the and worldwide, really, the the um, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, there is an artist who um, started taking photographs of black bodies, um, but with a particular light. Uh, so he would paint the bodies in this iridescent light first, and then take a photograph. Um, and uh, do it against the kind of dark. So it was like glow in the dark, basically. You would see instead of the color of the skin, an iridescent body, um, and then reflect that body back. And the idea was to say, what if we looked at bodies, not as black and white and brown and different colors, but instead the essence of the being of the individual, right? And trying to help people look beyond skin color and to instead understand that humanity 
is something iridescent. It is the it is the inside. It is the reflecting through the individual rather than based on just the appearance of the individuals. It's very powerful. The photographs are incredibly powerful, but the intention is also incredibly powerful to make people think and see things in a different way. I think that art um, and and poetry and music helps connect people and connect to people in the affective rather than just the cognitive. It helps engage people emotionally and to understand the depth and the power of the topics that we're talking about. So I think art is critical um, and transcends just a particular kind of engagement with people to help people truly understand an issue. We're almost out of time. Um, it would be remiss, I think, not to take the opportunity of a, of a question that again came in quite early to, to close this discussion. Um, which is which is as follows for all of the panelists what motivates you in your work in other words what drives you to keep investigating challenging and combating intolerance more than any other aspect of human rights Ahmed I'm going to ask you to, to have a first go at, at this question you're as you you and I have discussed on many occasions your energy is, is shocking and, and, and profoundly impressive how you managed to to keep doing the work that you do um, why well, you thank it? you, and a very good question. You know, on reflection, I find that nearly all the reports I did as a reporter on on Forbes was about intolerance, uh, because at the end of the day, that is the negation of our basic humanity, right? And from from there on, you know, um, it creates a con can create conditions in which people can engage in all sorts of horrible activities. So combating that, stemming that, you know, as it were, sort of stopping that opens up the gap for you to then work on the positive elements. So we need to first stem, that, stem the flow of the negatives and then see if you can push towards a positive. And I think um, the fact that even little things matter is highly motivating. And the fact that, um, you know, if you did nothing, obviously things that get worse, but that there are ways of doing things. And there are also, you know, huge communities of people who share, share the same enthusiasm or same commitment that's also quite quite motivating. So nothing like solidarity, uh, nothing like support, and nothing like working together. Thank you. Nita, does your work keep you keep you awake at night worrying about the dystopian future? It keeps me awake future? at night at worrying, but I, I, I do my work. What motivates my work is the hope and the belief of a better pathway forward for humanity. Um, and the belief that if we uh, talk about, recognize, Delay, debate and deliberate about these issues that collectively we will find a better pathway forward, but we can only do so by bringing these issues to the light and engaging one another on um, the issues to get to that better future together. Thank you. Maria, why'd you go to work? <laughs> well, I think it's uh, the, the topic of today's discussion is very core to the mandate of of the, the office where I work, of course. It's a part of broader prevention efforts as well. And I think it's uh, on a very, like personally, it's one of the reasons, of course, to, to want to work for, for the UN in this uh, particular office. It's to be able to contribute to, to those efforts. And I think uh, what uh, Ahmed uh, mentioned as well, I think it's seeing the, the small impacts is, is very uh, motivating. Thank you. Naz, finally. I, I think it's only one method and it's a drop in the ocean. But I find that people around the world, you know, there are so many actors working for the positive. They might not be the ones that have the, you know, the most uh, uh, pa power or that their voice is the most prominent. But most people want the best for most other people, if not all other people. And I think um, it, perhaps we're just a channel of echoing that and, and reminding others of that. I totally agree with everybody that, you know, positivity is, is not a false hope. It's a real, real hope. And actually, it's actually a reflection of what um, the vast majority of the world want for one another. And just as a very quick illustration of that, our, our colleague at Essex, uh, who's the director of the Human Rights Clinic, tweeted earlier today that um, it's findings and survey that the majority of people polled in the UK support social rights. Um, support, you know, rights to, to, to decent, adequate housing, health care, not having their children go to sleep hungry at night, et cetera, et cetera. So, so maybe the trends are actually moving, trying to be glass half full, which people who know me know is, is, is not characteristic of me, but trying to be glass half full. Maybe things are moving 
uh, as they get worse, maybe things are moving in the right direction in terms of support for, for our calls. Uh, I found this a really fascinating panel discussion. Thank you so much, panelists, for, for joining us from the different corners of the world that you have joined us. Thank Victor, likewise. I hope he's, I hope he's he arrived safely at his destination. Ahmed, thank you again for organizing this panel as we do every year. This has been one of the most stimulating, certainly the, of many stimulating panel discussions that I can recall. Uh, I'd also like to thank Felipe Ferreira, who's been in the background, uh, ensuring that, that we are coordinated and connected up and, and we have the right links to the right places and, and has made this all happen. So everyone, thank you so much. Thank you to those of you who have joined us. Um, have a, have a, safe, a safe day uh, and, and take care. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>